the uh, all of the material was, was in French and had to be translated, and all of the maps. Uh, although the German scientists were extremely uh, thorough, and we found out that we could use uh, the reports, the German reports would back them up, and they were accurate. And they were always scientific and the very best quality. These folios, incidentally, were about the size half of this table, and they had the terrain studies had maps, they had elevations, they had all of the information that I was just telling you about with water. The problem is um, what we could see from aerial maps was not accurate on the ground, and that was a great trap. We had a lot of trouble with that because, for example, Normandy had what they called the bocage. Um, it was traditional in Normandy that you divided up your farms for your sons. And if you had five sons, you divided up your farm in five <coughs> parts. And the way they divided them up was by uh, making walls out of dirt. They would just pile up the dirt. And over the years, the um, trees and shrubs grew on those, those piles of dirt. So we had these little, little farms with uh, the, uh, all the heavy foliage. And in England, uh, um, in England they, they demarked the uh, family plots with what they called hedgerows. So you would grow hedges. Well, we were thrown off very much because of the terminology. And if you look down with the with some of the aerial photographs, we could see the shrubbery going like this. And we, could, we, could, we, we realized that the term hedgerow. But in France, those hedgerows had been there since Roman occupation, and they were concrete. They were solid. They were fossilized roots, and there was no way to break them down and get through. With a British hedgerow, it was possible for tanks to go right through the hedgerows and go wherever they wanted to do. Um, if, if there had been um, an invasion in England, for example, you could have knocked down the hedgerows. But in France, there was no way that you could get through. You were channeled. So the tanks, when they went in on D-Day, the tanks were badly damaged because they were so confined with these alleys of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of these artificial hedgerows. They were totally artificial because they were, as I said, if you can imagine sun-hardened adobe, it was centuries old with these trees, 20-foot high trees growing out of these walls. So there was a tremendous amount of damage done with that. Uh, um, with the uh, um, uh, the first the first assault. Now we have another question. Oh, I have I have lots of questions. <laughs> so let's go back to your research. So as you were doing this research, they didn't tell you what the research was for. Um, did you ever recognize the locations? And especially once the invasion happened, how did it? How did you feel about that? When you, when it, did you put any of the pieces together and realize you were helping to plan and find information for a particular invasion? Well, that was a, a, a one thing that they, they had to do for security purposes is that um, um, if you, um, I, I received questions, you see, in um, the subjects that they wanted. But they would add questions from other parts of the world so that I might be looking at ice caps in Greenland at the same time I was looking at something in the China Seas at the same time I was looking at the Bocage in France. So there was always this camouflage. For example, um, my uh, uh, it was very unnerving that last year at Stanford because my 
my senior uh, advisor in the geology department, just before, um, um, just in November, he vanished. My, my favorite geology professor. And I was terribly upset because I was supposed to have a final with him. He was uh, going to finish so that I would graduate with all my credits, and all of a sudden a professor. So I finally tracked him, tracked him down. I was allowed, I was given the, uh, the permission to call his wife. <laughs> and he explained that I'm, I'm, his, uh, uh, I'm his student, and I'm, I'm left hanging. Somebody has to give me a test, and I was the only girl, remember, in the class, and they, they, they kind of gave me oversight, because I guess they, they weren't sure that this Friday female was really going to do it. <laughs> so, uh, um, so I explained my concern, and she said, well, I can't, um, I can't explain anything other than the fact he's been called to Washington on temporary uh, concerns. So that was the end of that subject. But the, uh, they were um, shuffling people around with the, uh, uh, at, at, at that time, <coughs> and they, as it turned out, um, that was, I figured out later, that was just when the romance run was happening. The United States was sending supplies to Russia because they were besieged as they were having trouble and the United States was being very helpful to them. And the Berlinsk run was terribly important and there were very few Russian speakers in the United States. And my professor was Russian. So they had simply borrowed him to the military geology unit before I got there. I'm not, uh, been, that was very typical. That became very much part of the action, is that they would borrow professors and borrow specialists in other fields and bring them into the military geology unit for work on these folios. And then when they were through with their project, whatever they specialized in, some of them were water specialists, some of them were uh, <coughs> vegetation specialists, for example, was that situation with with vege vegetation cover was very deceptive because we had poor quality um, aerial photographs and some of the photographs we couldn't, we couldn't figure out what some of the, what kind of foliage it was so we would get specialists in to look at it. We had stereopticons, but they were very primitive stereopticons with, um, you had two units like this and you had convergence here, and you looked at them, with, you became cross-eyed in order to, to look at it. Actually, your eyes go this way, and you're still seeing it. You could see a three-dimensional type of, uh, of, of picture that way. With the, so we did, we did borrow people, and we did get them to, uh, on short-term specialists, but I never did get my final with my professor. <laughs> I, um, professor, I really, really was not fond of. It. Gave me my, <laughs> gave me my final, and really did bother me. <laughs> so, just got one more question before we open it up to questions. Um, so, there weren't many women in the field of geology at that time. When you look back. Is there anything that stands out about being a woman in a field dominated by men? Well, actually, you know, that's, that's an interesting question because the first woman geologist from Stanford was Lou Henry, who was, Cal who was uh, Herbert Hoover's wife. Oh. And that, that, that was a real benchmark um, because they felt that uh, um, she'd done quite well marrying the President of the United States. <laughs> so that, that, that other women coming in might have a ghost of a chance too. <laughs> they might run out of presidents, but at least they, they had proved themselves worthy. But um, actually, the only thing that I felt, um, I never, as I said, I was so accustomed 
to the world of geology because of the way I was brought up. I didn't think it was different, but um, I think that the treatment was different because I think that the other men were a little cautious, and um, uh, which is a nice way of putting it, incidentally. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, later, I worked for um, the Signal Oil Company in Los Angeles, and they were very welcoming, and I had very interesting assignments. And of course, I had war stories by that time. So I could hold my own with the men. So that gave me a little footing also. It wasn't as though I didn't have some kind of a, a, a case record at that point. That, that, uh, I had worked in the field also. So, uh, that's it. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up to, if anyone has any questions, um, we got about 10 more, about 10, 15 more minutes left. So are there any questions? <coughs> so I'm gonna have you talk into the mic so our camera can pick up the questions. Uh, Ruth, I'm Bob Meyer. Thank you very much for a lot of insight from, from history. Uh, I do have a quick question, but um, that probably be a more detailed answer. Have you had the opportunity to visit the beaches in Normandy? And if so, did the terrain analysis that you might have done for that particular area prove to be the correct terrain analysis that was used by the troops when they were landing in those areas? Did I, I didn't hear the first part, did you? Um, have you visited Normandy and the beaches in Normandy? No, no. my son did. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I didn't have a chance to. And I did visit, in later years, I did visit, uh, um, we worked on um, another other plans, I, uh, um, Italy. I did have a chance to go. I saw a lot of casino, which was a disaster. I, I did get to some of the places, but normally I didn't go to. You know, wars were not fine. We're not what were were not very good to my family. I lost uh, an uncle that I never knew in the First World War, and another uncle came home, gassed from the First World War, and in the Second World War, my only, my only boy cousin was killed over in Normandy in the, in the B-17, and um, I really didn't, I, I really didn't want to go to Normandy. Uh, one, one question for clarification. I, I'm a military person, I've been over in Europe. One of the questions that I've always been looking for answers for is what does the D in D Day stand okay. for? What were the yeah. rumors yeah. going around? You know, that's that's ask and never explained. And I really should have tired of started my talk today. I forgot that. D is um, D is um, an army term for the day that it begins. So if you have D minus one, it's one day before D day, and D and D day starts at midnight, which is very interesting because they shouldn't have done what they did. They started the, at, uh, um, at at Utah. Um, they had a full moon, and they shouldn't have had a full moon because the clarity of that moon when it comes down to silhouettes, everybody. And, and, and that's another thing that with the, uh, um, with those folios, we emphasized the faces of the moon and, and when it would be safe. You know, that, uh, that uh, you bring up an interesting subject because the nearest thing that I can get to describe um, that beachhead would be, um, you know, that ocean view drive along Carmel, <laughs> the Carmel Beach. Um, how steep that cliff is and how wide that beach is. It's kind of comparable to the way that that Normandy beach was. But you can imagine if you came in in bright moonlight and those people had to come up on that broad flat beach and that cliff is heavily armored 
so that they're all shooting right at all these people coming up. That was a terrible thing to happen. And then um, the, um, the other one, that's um, um, Omaha. Um, they, uh, uh, you can think, the nearest thing you can get to that would be, these are just very small um, ideas that I'm giving you. The other one was uh, um, Carmel, the mouth of the river, where there's the reeds and the swamp, and the river flows out. If you could magnify that to make it about 10 times bigger, and you flooded all of those, that back part and the back reeds, that's what happened. And we, we could see that there was a marsh there. We could look down and see that, I mean, through the, you know, through the the photographs that they took. Obviously, there was a marsh there, but what had happened was that the Germans had flooded it. So when these people rushed in there with all their weight and their gear on, they drowned. That was a terrible waste of the United States. With them. And we had another tragic example, and that was Tarawa. At Tarawa, the uh, um, the, the invasion was planned that at low water they would bring these, um, uh, they were uh, 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 amphibious, uh, amphibious, um, um, not trucks, am, am, amphibious tractors. They would bring the amphibious tractors in on the edge of the coral reef. The coral reef is stuck on top of a submerged mountain. And that's why it's flat and shallow. So they would bring in this um, flotilla of young men and their amphibious tractors. And it would be at low tide, but the tide would be turning. So there would be this strong, very strong high tide that would rush in and float them in over the coral atoll, and then they could jump out of the tractors, the amphibious tractors, and go right on shore and be ready to fight. But they didn't have the right information. So what happened was that they got the tractors up there at the low tide, waiting for the high tide to come in. Nothing happened. Because it was the neap tide that they didn't know about. And the high tide never came. So these young men were stranded in these amphibious tractors. And so they still had to get to shore. So they said, well, jump off. And you can wade to shore. But the water there was so deep, and they had 60-pound packs on with all their gear. So they lost almost 5,000 young men in that. They, they either were mowed down by enemy artillery on the, on the shore, or they were drowned in the water trying to get off the coral reef to get on shore. There were some terrible things that happened, and that's why these pre-invasion plans were important to <coughs> protect as much as we could protect with them. All right, we have one question in the back. <clears throat> It's, it's sort of uh, more of a comment. I believe that D -Day, the time that they uh, scheduled for D-Day was based between two storms that were coming through uh, the English Channel. Yeah. And that's the reason why you had the clear weather. Yeah. yeah. You're right. You're correct. Uh, the, the date was postponed. Everything was, and that was, that was another error in, 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 the, in, the, in the war. Also, because, you see, they had all these soldiers, they were pinned up in the transport craft, and they were there long enough to get seasick. <laughs> so they, they weren't eating, they weren't eating, they were vomiting, they were dehydrated, and then they were dropped off of those ships to get to shore with, as I said, this, this heavy, this heavy pack. It was, it was, it was, it was um, do you know D-Day, actually, um, was a catastrophe. 
And the only reason that we won, they won, the groups won, is there were five beachheads. And that battleground was 50 miles long. 50 miles is from here to King City. That's how long that that beachhead stretched out. And that's just beyond comprehension. Had we not had so many troops, so many ships, and so many involved in it, it was sheer volume that gave us the war. And it was a terrible, terrible thing to happen. We have to think. We, we need to think more clearly. We need to teach history in school. It's terrible that we don't teach history in school because the, uh, the United States was very well warned that trouble was coming because there was a tripartite decision. Italy, Germany, and Japan <coughs> in 1941 signed a tripartite agreement that they would help each other. So we knew we had a problem right then and there. We knew that the United States was going to stand alone. So that was the time to have started to push back <coughs> and to start to do other things that we ended up with Dita. All right, got time for just one or two more questions. So. Just a comment. The last Californian, the weekend edition, has yes. an old section about yes. Dita. It is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I think if everybody, if everybody read that, they would understand the magnitude of, of the war. And um, I'd like to send a copy to every congressman. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, it's, my, it's my firm belief that old men plan wars and young men fight them and die. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Because they were trying to keep it secretive, did they give you enough information about when? Because I know the no. terrain would have to change. No. Um, so you essentially you were blind in more than one way in order yeah. to give them the information that they needed. Yeah. It was very, you're right, it was very deceptive, except that everything had a deadline. You know, they, uh, the people that were working on the folio had to do the folio. Well, for example, they started in North Africa, and uh, um, they wanted to get that folio done and out of the way. So then they started in on Sicily, and they wanted to get that one out of the way. But we never knew deadlines, and as I said, they were very deceptive, because I would get quest questions of other countries that were extraneous to what. The only exception is when I was finally assigned to the Philippines. I was put on the Philippines, everything about the Philippines. It was all Philippines. But then you know how many islands there are in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> all right, last question. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Ma'am? <clears throat> no, right over here. Oh, um, I'm just curious, Doctor. You were very important work during the war. Um, how did you end up in I, I can't hear. I don't oh, care very well. Hold it close. My hearing. How did you end up How did you end up in Salinas? Oh. After the war. Oh, I, I married a local man. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody I had met at Stanford. So. All right. We are just about out of time, so I just want to thank you, Ruth, for everything you've done during the war for the environment, for this community. So thank you very, very much. And thank you for coming and sharing your stories and speaking with us. I said I waited 75 years. Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to thank you all for coming out and uh, listening to Ruth. And uh, if you want to see some of the um, her materials, not her, but 
some examples of materials she used to do some of her research. Uh, we have a display over there that has um, quite a few artifacts that Ruth would have done and used during her, uh, her research during the war. And again, thank you all for coming, and um, have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you.